Readjusting to civilian life, it's kind of the million dollar question. I think I'm luckier than a lot of guys in the platoon, you know, some of them are just going back to an empty apartment, maybe a cousin or an uncle. I got, you know, I got people I'm going home to. I got a wife, I've got a little girl. You know, it's been four years since I've really been there for them, but yeah, you know, I'm just gonna put myself into that 100%, you know, just every morning get up, try to be the best dad, the best husband I can be, and go to bed each night being better than I was when I woke up. I got some wrongs to right first. I left in the middle of my 12-step program, <laughs> left off at step nine making amends, so I got to apologize to a lot of people, just fix things with a lot of people. Then I guess I should try to find some kind of job where I'm not getting shot at every day. <laughs> you know, something a little more normal. There's a lot of reasons you joined the military. I don't think anybody does it for just one, but if you want to ask why I walked into the office with the recruiter that day, I had uh, found out my girlfriend was pregnant two days before. And to that point, I've been working in this bar that my family owned in Lowell, and I just realized this isn't going to be a way I can make a life for them. This isn't going to be a way I can take us forward as a family. So I went out, and you know, if I'd, if I'd gone by like the Peace Corps or Salvation Army, if one of them had been closer, maybe that's where I'd be. But there was a armor recruiting station two blocks over from the bar, so I walked in, and here I am. Well, you know, joining the military was never even really a question for me. It was a familial obligation. My great-grandfather served in the U.S. Navy in World War II. My grandfather served in the Air Force in Vietnam. My father served in the Marines in the Gulf War, and here I am. Private Timothy Porter, 101st Airborne, Iraq. Why? I turned 18 and my dad said, well, you can't stay here anymore, so you better find something to do, buddy. And pizza place I was working at was not paying enough for rent, so it was military or homeless. So I joined up because I had nowhere else to go. Yeah. Sometimes it feels like every day is a close call out there, but there is one incident that stands out. I was on patrol with my squad, the squad before I started with these guys, and I was walking in front of our Humvee, was scanning for IEDs, when suddenly, the next thing I know, I'm flat on my ass, and so is the guy next to me. I look up and there's this huge Hollywood-style fireball going up in front of me, Turns out that uh, the insurgents in this area weren't very well equipped and improvised an explosive out of gasoline. And that's the fireball. Luckily, uh, none of our men were very close to the explosion, but I can't say the same for the locals. They I don't remember the close calls. I remember the... I remember the ones that were too close to the ones around me. Something almost kills you. Everything almost kills you. I think you form deep relationships with everybody you, you serve with. 
you know, every man and woman you're out there with, just knowing that you're in that together, that creates a bond. But it goes deeper with some than others. There's just, you know, like in the real world, you meet people you click with more than you do anywhere else. And uh, for me, there's uh, one guy, Mike Briggs. We, uh, we've actually been stationed together for the entirety of our deployment. We did a tour in Afghanistan. We're now on our second tour in Iraq. And I mean, I love that guy. I'd do anything for him, and I know he'd do the same for me. I say we got some pretty good relationships, some pretty interesting ones. Uh, one thing that always, one relationship that always comes to mind is Mark Mercer. Me and that guy, we've been been through a lot together, and he was even my best man at my wedding. It's the kind of relationship that I feel like is gonna last a long time. Don't tell them this, but they're my family. Uh, I think the world of every, each and every one of those guys and girls. And uh, I lay my life down for every one of them. Honestly, you just can't dwell on all the hardships. I... I just do my job. It's not always clear what your job is, so... I think I find things to do. Uh, to help people. To help my platoon, to help the people around here. I go on runs. Dad always told me, if you sweat it out, you won't cry it out. So every time I feel like I'm going to have some sort of a breakdown, I just go on a run. It may not be the healthiest choice, but I really try to avoid focusing on the hardships, and the shit that goes down. The more time you just spend thinking about it, to me, the more time you've got to, for it to get permanently ingrained. And I'd like to forget some of this stuff. Probably won't happen, but it'd be nice. My biggest fear is that one day I'm going to freeze. I'm going to be out there in the middle of it and one of the guys in the company is going to need me to lay down cover fire, to get out there, pull a wounded buddy back, and I'm just not going to be able to. I mean, you see it happen. You see guys who will just break. And you can't never really tell who it's going to be. My biggest fear is coming back from a mission alone. Coming back home and, and not being 100%, you know, losing a leg over there, losing an arm, finger, toe, anything, you know, coming back and not being me. I need everything I was born with to be me, and if I don't have that, I, I'm nothing, man. That's what I'm most scared of. <laughs> well, thank you for <laughs> assuming that I'm sane. Uh, I think you have to be a little bit crazy to be here. It's kind of hard some days, um, but what I like to do is get my book, put on my robe, just read, relax, try to at least. Um, I read. A lot. You know, it kind of helps to get away for a few hours. Um, you know, I write, I keep a journal. Um, I'm really a people watcher, but it's significantly less interesting when you're around the same five, six guys all the time. 
you just learn to find new stuff in the same routines. You know, when you're off duty, you play cards. You, but you know, you play cards with the same deck for eight months straight, and you start to learn. You learn every wrinkle and every fold in the cards. So the game becomes, you know, can you recognize the back of the cards the guy's holding? And everybody around the table's doing it, and it just the game changes over time and stuff like that. You just find new ways to make the old stuff work. Of course I've changed. Everybody changes. It's impossible not to. You see, guys you've been with for two, three, four years go down one day, just all of a sudden, out of the blue. And you're never expecting it. And it just, every time you lose somebody else, you think, no, I'm, I'm never going to lose them. That's not going to happen. And then you do. You know, I don't really think the military's changed me. I've always been a nervous wreck, but the military gave me something to be nervous about, I guess. Though, looking back, I suppose I actually have. I'm a lot more disciplined than when I first joined. I used to be something of a rebel. There's no room for that in basic. <laughs> I hope so. It's been over 16 years. Uh, I, uh, I feel like I've got a purpose. I think before I joined the army, I, I didn't feel so much like I had a purpose, and I feel like I do now. I feel like uh, I've become as much of the man as I wanted to be. You know, that's a tough question for me. I think joining the army was worth it for me, because I've, I need to do my duty to my family and to my country. The, the porters are soldiers. That's just who we are. We've been soldiers since the 40s. And it was time for me to honor my family's legacy and serve my country. Call it Bushido, call it pride, call it whatever you want to, but it was time for me to serve. I think it was worth it, yeah. I know why I went in. I went in to do right by the people back home who depended on me. And I think I've done that. You know, every, every day out there when it gets hard, when it just seems like it's too tough, I, you, I think back to my wife, to my little girl, and I think I'm doing this for them. In the long run, I'm gonna say no. Um, <sighs> um, yeah, just with everything that I've seen down here, everything that's happened, everything I've sacrificed, you know, if I could, if I could go back and do it over, I wouldn't, I wouldn't join again. I would say it wasn't worth it. I'm gonna hug my husband. I'm gonna hug my parents. I'm gonna get myself a real cup of coffee. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna sleep. I'm gonna sleep for as long as my body is gonna let me. And then I'm just gonna lie there, and I'm just gonna listen to the silence. No helos taken off, no munitions, nothing, just gonna lie in a bed and listen to the quiet.
I'm gonna kiss my wife, I'm gonna put on my robe, crack open a nice cold beer, sit in my old beat up recliner, and watch the Steelish. Um. Gonna get in my car. Gonna drive. Gonna find my son. Gonna hug him. Gonna tell him I love him. Hopefully then, Let me be a part of his life again. Um, I, I hope so. Um, maybe we'll go hunting, fishing, swimming, uh, whatever it is he wants to do.